I'm going to be talking on the next uh, uh, topic, which is on uh, postprandial uh, effects, and I'm not really going to t touch too much on the hemostatic markers, but I'm going to touch on one, which is on factor seven, which is how um, I originally got involved in this area of interesterified fats. Um, we had been working in the UK looking at hemostatic factors and risk of cardiovascular disease and we found one of them, factor 7 coagulant activity, was predictive of sudden cardiac uh, death and we started doing a series of experiments trying to explain what was causing the variation in our, our population and tracked it down to uh, dietary triglyceride and found a very strong relationship with plasma triglyceride levels and factor 7 and then we started doing studies looking at uh, the types of fats affected it. So I came into it not from a lipoprotein area, but it's come a, an area where I've got done more work and got more interested um, in, particularly with regard now to um, insulin resistance syndrome and uh, postprandial lipid metabolism. So I, I come from King's College. Uh, London. I'm actually Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics, but I head up the Diabetes and Nutritional Science Division in, in the School of Medicine, and I've had, uh, had to have much more to do with diabetes research in the last uh, few years. Um, my research, um, most of the research we did in this area in the earlier days of Factor 7 was funded by the UK Food Standards Agency um, and the Department of Health, and also the Medical Research Council, um, and more recently we've been doing some work with the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, which is a government agent research institute, um, which has funded some of the work which I'll, I'll present on the um, interest verified palm oil. Uh, other conflict of interest I've probably put, should have put up, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Global Dairy Program. Um, so I think that's a sort of an industrial thing. But uh, I said in the past, you know, I have worked with uh, various uh, sectors of the food industry. We did some work on salad trim um, back in about 2000. So the available data there is out there on postprandial studies, there are a lot of quite small studies. And it's quite a nice summer a study by... Um, Keith Frames group in Oxford was looking at um, basically SOO versus OSO enzymatically um, produced material and this work was very much related to um, mechanistic work looking at the development of beta a uh, um, enzymatically produced uh, palm oil based triglyceride that was used for infant feeding. There are two studies by Yali Jokopi and uh, um, various other people with unpronounceable names at Calio. Heike Calio is the lead person there, who've done some studies on structures, but most of those studies have really been about techniques, about application of mass spectrometry to the measurement of different um, triglyceride structures rather than being clinical trials. And as a, uh, a smallish study by Christine Williams's group, by example, S, um, which looked at um, beta pole, which is the uh, enzymically um, um, produced material. So of the one, I think we've done most, see, my groups and most of the randomized controlled trials, and we've all had at least 16 <coughs> subjects in typically 18, 20, and the most recent one, which we published in AJCN, uh, um, had uh, 50 subjects in. One of the earlier studies we did was this, this one with salatrim. And salatrim is a structured triglyceride. It's a C, C3, uh, um, C18 triglyceride. Um, and we, were, we did this work. Uh, 
mainly because there were concerns that scaric acid might be thrombogenic in salad shrimp, and um, and this led to our, our other interests to, to do further work at looking at scaric acid rich triglycerides. I'll try and walk you through that. So the problems with previous studies, and I say this up to Ronald and uh, my study, a recent one, is that quite often there's small numbers of subjects. You need you need at least about 18 subjects to get power to pick up anything. And if you do studies on young, healthy females, the fat goes straight for the hips and the thighs in those ladies. And they show hardly any increase in, in plasma triglycerides after a meal. Um, so that's a bit of a problem with looking at those studies. And particularly jockopies, I think they're all on you know, 11 healthy young females. The other problem is about standardized protocol for test meal study, how much fat to use. Some people have used you know, 40 grams of fat, and really in our experience it's really not enough. We did do a dose response study back inside the Nordic Heart Heart study where we looked at increasing doses 40, 50, 60, even 90, and we found 50 was tolerable. It's about what the maximum amount of fat anyone would eat at a meal. You could probably do it with a, you know, McDonald's quite easily without having two double McMuffin, whatever it is. Um, and you, the, the meal we use is a muffin, big muffin, and a milkshake. Now we can, if we use a really big muffin, we can get 50 grams of fat in it. But typically we get about 30, 35 grams baked into the muffin and the rest we just put into a shake about 200 mils. The advantage of using this is it actually um, it's quite rapidly digested, absorbed, and you can consume it quite quickly, which is really important when you're doing test meal. So if people chewing away you know, and say, I can't get this down, you're getting different start points. The other problem I think we've had is um, to do with melting point when you interest terrify that. So, some of the earlier work we did, for example, randomizing cocoa butter or uh, shea butter, we landed up producing a lot of fats with really high melting point uh, bits in there. So, so we used NMR to measure the uh, fraction of high melting point fats, and we are finding we're getting you know 15% of uh, fats, um, high melting point fats, at about 50 degrees, which is higher, it's much, much different from what actually is commercially used. So we've been very careful recently to use interesterified fats that are equivalent to those being commercially used. The other problem with looking at data is that most studies haven't measured remnant particles. They've measured triglyceride or they've cholesterol, free fatty acids. And the argument has been with postprandial lipemia, there are two aspects of it. One is the, the peak lipemia you get and how high that goes, and the other one is whether you have persistent of remnants at about six to eight hours. There's quite a lot of data from epidemiological uh, studies to show that non-fasting triglycerides are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And there are various mechanisms why that may be so. Um, it may be you, what you're looking at is actually remnants, but you may also be looking at a group of people who've just got overproduction of very low density lipoprotein uh, it's coming out. But non-fasting triglycerides are emerging, but people haven't done test meal studies um, for the prospective studies to look at, at risk. So the only data we have from prospective studies really is non-fasting lipids. So Ronald will talk later about um, the effects of dietary fats in a fasting state, but you know most of the time we're in a fed state. You're in a fed state now, and I hope you're not going to fall to sleep. Um, but after a meal, um, three to four hours after a meal, you'll have a peak lipemia, and then that will will die away. The trouble is, we have another meal a little bit later, and you can get an added notch up, and um, some studies that have been looking at postprandial lipemia have used a two-step meal. They do one meal in the morning and then a 
and added bolus of fat later on. Those are a little bit tricky to interpret because some people are saying you know, there's a second meal effect. You get the lipids in the first meal started being released from lymphatics in circulation later on. So we've tended to stick with doing single meal studies. But I think when you look at postprandial lipemia, you need to think about that overall design. So what we're looking at basically is the uptake of free fatty acids and monoacylglycerol. Just say the two monoacylglycerol stays in that position um, on absorption. So we get a cleavage of the chylomicron uh, releasing free fatty acids. And, and endothelial cells are pretty good at trapping fatty acids. Very little escapes into circulation really on lipolysis. So nearly all the fat that's lipolyzed, which is in the SN13 position, is taken up into the adipocyte. Um, so if you look at, I'll show you some data later, when you look at um, postprandial uh, phase, you tend to find that, you know, non esterified fatty acids are dipping in the phase rather than actually going up. And then we have the remnant part of them. I think an issue which I'm uncertain about is whether the, the fatty acid in the two position is preferentially delivered to the liver. And I think this is quite an important question to answer. Or is there some rearrangement in circulation, isomerization, you go from a two monoglyceride to a one, mono, one monoglyceride, and then that comes substrate for lip uh, lipase, and then it goes into adipose tissue. So if we're delivering the fatty acid directly to the liver, it might have a different biological uh, effect than if it's just being picked up by muscle and adipose tissue. So this is what it looks like if you've had a, a famous English uh, dish, which is one thing the English are famous for, is fish and chips. And if you want to get postprandial lipemia, it's a very good way of doing it. Um, battered chips, and three hours after them, you see the little cardamicon particles in, in the blood except for the ladies amongst you, you probably don't show that much. But, um, and what we think is a concern is of having elevated uh, triglycerides in blood is that you can't transfer when you have ele prolonged elevation of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, you activate cholesterol ester transfer protein reactions. So you swap triglyceride for cholesterol ester. So the, the remnant comes enriched with cholesterol ester, LDL and HDL get enriched in triglyceride, and LDL and HDL that are enriched in triglyceride come um, substrates for hepatic lipase, and that generates small, dense LDL and HDL. And we're starting to recognize that you know LDL density is, is quite important independent risk um, for, for vascular disease. And it may also explain why you get you know, reductions of HDL when you have um, persistent elevation of uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Now, this you could have elevated triglyceride-rich lipoproteins either from remnants or from VLDL synthesis. So, if you have excess VLDL synthesis, say from carbohydrate intake, that will also lead to uh, a background increased level of, of high triglycerides. And I think what we're not entirely sure about is whether rem how much a role remnants have in causing small dense LDL. But they certainly compete with very low density lipoprotein for metabolism. Now, this is some of the early work we had done where we were looking, we'd given test meals and we'd, we'd varied the type of fatty acids. So the bottom line here is a low fat diet. This is a diet that's got some long chain fatty acids in, but is mainly MCT. This is stearate rich diet and here at the top here is oleate rich. This study was done originally to look at postprandial effects of um, trans fatty acids versus other fatty acids. And I mean, trans actually didn't differ from, from cis. But what we did notice was quite an interesting 
low lipemia following a stearic acid rich diet, which was unexpected uh, to us because we had done some previous work with, with cocoa butter and found it was quite good at causing postprandial lipemia. The MCT is quite easy to explain because it's absorbed by uh, the hepatic portal system doesn't go into chylomicrons. And we tend to express our results as area under the curve. Um, and if you express this way, it's much easier to see that, you know, in this study, we found much lower levels of postprandial lipemia stearate. Um, and, you know, the highest with earlier. And consistently, <laughs> we find earlier acid is the best thing if you want to get a lot of postprandial lipemia. And it's our low-fat meal, nothing happens. So, we, when we did this Salatrim study, and the purpose of the study was to look at procoagulant activity, not postprandial lipemia. So we had measured triglycerides only at three points, which is a limitation, you know, not three hours and six hours. And what we found is that the, the Salatrim led to a really quite marked uh, reduction in uh, the increase in triglycerides compared to either cocoa butter, which is our natural alternative steroid rich fat or um, try some, I think it was oleate rich diet. We also showed our main outcome was a really quite dramatic effect on fat 7 coagulant activity. We really got no increase in fat 7 coagulant activity after the salad trim, but did with cocoa butter and the higher layer oil. And this was due mainly to differences in the activated form of uh, factor seven. We have a mutant tissue factor that uh, we can use to very precisely uh, measure factor seven uh, activated that James Morrissey developed. So we, after this, we, we scratched our heads a bit and said, why are we getting these differences between uh, salad trim, steric, grits, and cocoa butter? And I, I thought, well, it might be something to do with triglyceride structure. Um, and so we randomized the cocoa butter and uh, fed it to um, about 20 subjects. And um, bingo, we got reduced postprandial lipemia with the randomized fat, and uh, which is shown here, um, decreased incremental under the curve. Under, and we also got, um, I haven't got it here, we also got reduced activation of factor seven. So that, that, looked, that looked okay. We then went and tried doing the same thing with shea butter, which is mainly SOS, and randomized it. And surprisingly with shea butter, we got pretty fat lines with both forms of shea butter. But when we compared the shea butter with higher leg sunflower oil, we found that shea butter full stop reduced postprandial lipemia. So if we got a, a lower increase in triglycerides, we got less activation of that seven. We then thought, well, let's turn our, our minds to uh, the other saturated fat, which um, tropical oil, which is palm oil. And this study was done with, I got palm, but it, it's, it's, um, it's a palm fraction. It's not palm only, it's the next one down. So it's got about 35, it's mainly POO rather than POP fraction. Uh, I think they call it super lane. And we, we randomized this and we got differences in postprandial lipemia. So we're getting less lipemia and we got less activation of fat 7. And this has been a very consistent finding. However, by this time, we're starting to look at the physical properties of the fat using um, calorimetry and NMR. And what we find is that you can predict the uh, effects on postprandial lipemia by the solid fat index at um, different temperatures. So, for example, um, unrandomized cocoa butter has got a very low uh, melt. It's normally melted about 35 degrees. No solids really above 37. But when we go to uh, randomized cocoa butter in the green here, you see we got a lot of high melting point <laughs> solids. Um, our shea butter, interestingly, had high solids anyway, and randomizing shea didn't make a huge difference. And we've done the same thing with palm oil. 
we can look at those fractions in there and predict effects. So that was a limitation to it, the, the study we've done. We didn't really know whether it is position of the fatty acids or whether it's the melting points. Um, so looking a little bit at the methodology, we think we need 50 grams to get reputative lipemia. Um, we realize it's very important to characterize the test fat by uh, not only chemical composition having full triglyceride structure, but also the physical characteristics doing NMR at different um, time um, temperatures and differential uh, scanning calorimetry. And what we do know is you have to be very careful on these studies to make sure subjects don't go and do exercise the day before because it influences the response and you need to make sure they're on a sort of low fat meal the day before. So we've got very standardized protocol for feeding people. The other thing is very important, the test meals got to be consumed quickly uh, because otherwise you get a big variability if you're measuring releases of hormones. And we think in terms of blood sampling, some of our early studies, we didn't sample that frequently. Um, but you know, up to eight hours, I think, is maximal. Uh, they're getting a really bit fed up with uh, having blood samples by then. And it's very important you give people access to water. So we allow people to consume up to 750 mils of water over a period, but sit. Because you don't want them consuming large amounts of water that cause increases in plasma volume. Um, some studies have got some odd results because the people are getting rapidly dehydrated to take more and more blood out of them, don't get many to drink. Um, and it's important to report incremental area under the curve rather than absolute area under the curve because that takes away what the baseline values are. And you know, some of the early studies we did were not done double blind. The salad trim study was, um, but some of the ones are, are, were open label um, in terms of at least the investigator knew it. So the recent study we've been doing have been done double blind. So that means getting all the materials prepared and labeled by someone independent. Now, we've moved on to look also at the same time, if you're doing this, look at glucose and insulin responses. And really need 75, 80 grams of carbohydrate to get a good insulin response. Glycemic index testing uses 50 grams, which is quite a bit lower. Um, we think it's better to measure C-peptide, it's a marker of, index of insulin secretion. And why we advise this is because sometimes you get some hemolysis of blood, and if you get hemolyzed blood, it's hopeless measuring insulin on, whereas C-peptide is much easier to, is much more stable. And then you don't also have the other problems about whether you're measuring true insulin, pro-insulin, and everything else. Insulin assays are a bit of a nightmare. And so... For these glucose insulins, we would, uh, we're doing 0, 15, 30, 60, 90, 120. If you can do a 45 minute sample, it's fine. But if you're doing quite extensive sampling, um, quite often you don't have time to do the 45 minute. But you know, it, it's a lot of work if you're doing them. If it's a minor sample, you can do just one blood. But if you're doing four or five, Files reflecting into it's quite difficult to fit them in so tightly. And uh, you know, I'd recommend people look at gut peptides, particularly CHIP and GLP-1. I'll show you why. So we we looked at the idea that interesterifying fats in, with palmitic acid in the SN2 would decrease postprandial lipemia. And it's a study Roland and I did. And we our aim was to see whether changing the structure to a predominantly SN2 would reduce lipemia. And we reckon we need 48 subjects. We did it men and women. And there's our secondary outcomes here. And we had the gut hormones as exploratory outcomes. Most of this data is now published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the other paper is languished. The one with the JIP, I think, is languishing with the British Journal of Nutrition, waiting for them to get back to us. Um, so we used two centers, crossover design, and it's done double blind. Um, so Maastricht recruited 24 in London, we got 26, and we gave the treatments in, according to Latin square design. Um, <coughs> so we, the orders were effectively were randomized. 
and this is to show you what the composition of the native Parmalayan was, like 45% saturated fat. Um, we were very careful um, to try and keep the PUFA as constant as we could. We, we ideally wanted an enzyme esterified SN2 rich um, fat, but we, we couldn't get one, so we did the next best thing was use lard, which is about 70% um, of the palmitate is in the SN2, and you see of the SN2 fatty acids you've got 55% um, as a palmitate. So native palm alone has some in, and that's mainly from the diglycerides in palm oil. It's about 8-10% diglycerides in the palm alone we use. And uh, we had Hylex sunflower oil here. So it's about 900 calories in here, 50 grams of fat. And this is looking at solid fat index of the different fats. And uh, the interest verified palm oil we use here is very similar really to lard. It said it had two blips in terms of the melting points on DSC. Well, lard had a very clean melting point, about 33 degrees. The interest verified had a, a, a peak a little bit lower, about 18, another one a little bit later. Um, but you'll see parmalane is, is a really a liquid oil. Uh, below 20 degrees. Um, so this is the protocol. It's quite quite busy. So the day before, they, we give them a standard evening meal, uh, like a pasta bake or something low calorie, um, fixed amount of calories. They come in fasting, we cannulate them, and then we get blood for the lipids hourly. We were getting blood for cytokines, fat 7, as well, and then we over the the first early period we're getting samples for gut hormones. So it's quite a lot of preparation to collect all of those samples and doing these sort of studies. So this is what we found with the triglycerides, and uh, what we did. And here's the area of the curve, but what you can see the blue line is highlight sunflower oil, and the Orange is um, the palm, native parmalane, and very similar sort of curves going up, quite rapid uh, absorption, and then falling back down to normal. With the large, surprisingly, a delayed um, increase, but a really a quite an, a good return back back down to normal. So no idea oh, with the large. Uh, which is SN2 rich, uh, you know, leading to any persistence. The interest verified fat was quite similar in the early phase, but we landed up with slightly higher triglycerides at the eight-hour period compared to the inter, uh, the native palm oil. And we think this may be due to some tri um, saturated um, components in the interest verified palm oil, but it's a relatively small effect. And if you look at this, is the uh, linear trend for the increasing amounts of SN2, we seem to get, you know, it seems to fit the idea that the the higher the proportion of the SN2 is, it has an effect in the integrated area of the curve. Now, SN2 rich triglycerides are actually slightly more rapidly digested in both in the gut by the enzymes as well as in, in circulation. And this we think may be why the lard um, has got quite a, a, you know, a good return back to baseline. There's been some other work done looking at SN2 rich fats, showing they're quite easily cleaved. What I'm not showing you here is if we did, we did look at the kind of micron structure, and it very mirrored really the the dietary fat. So the SN2, if we have more palmitic acid than the SN2, that is reflected in. The chylomicron. We we found slightly more linoleic acid in the chylomicron than was in the diet, and we suspect we're getting linoleic acid from um, lecithin. We looked at non esterified fatty acid changes. You get a a prompt reduction on feeding a meal in in EFA, but we got some differences between the lard and the interesterified fat compared with the hyaluric sunflower oil. 
it remained slightly lower. And we think this subtle difference here is probably due to the higher NEFA levels on the higher sunflower and palm oil, probably due to initially higher rate of lipolysis occurring because the triglycerides were much higher uh, initially on the higher alert sunflower oil. But later on, you know, there's no difference uh, at the end uh, here with, with non-esterified fatty acid levels. Um, we looked at apolife protein B48 levels, and there was a sort of gender times um, um, treatment interaction with time. The women had pretty flat curves for AFOV, produced much less AFOV48. But overall, the if you just look at the deviations, the um, higher lake sunflower oil actually led to greater secretion of AFOV48 than uh, the lard or the interesterified fat. And there's no evidence of really of uh, at the end of any difference here in um, in the APA B48. So even though earlier initially led to higher APA B48, it went back down to basal level again. And we know that OLA in HEP, uh, the G2 cells, is quite good at secreting, or intestinal cells will secrete APA B100, but also intestinal cells, incubated CACO2 cells, it will produce APA B48. What we found was quite interesting, this is novel, was we found a difference in, in glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. And this really mirrored the effect we got on the triglycerides. So the high lake sunflower oil and palm oil led to greater secretion of JIT compared to the interesterified uh, palm oil and lard, which are pretty much identical. We initially did this as exploratory analysis just in the King's cohort, found the study and couldn't believe it. So we did it repeated it on Ronald's cohort and got exactly the same findings. So we're pretty confident this is a true bill, and it's not just a random uh, chance thing. We looked at GLP-1, and, but our GLP-1 values are a bit all over the place because we didn't collect it in um, another uh, thing called DPP, which we should have used. And um, for um, GLP-1, it's a quite an unstable peptide. We also looked at PYY, um, which is a quite an interesting peptides sort of have a lot to do with appetite control and found no effect. So this is specifically a thing we noticed with JIP. Now JIP has effects on, as an incretin increasing insulin release, but it also has an effect in stimulating life protein lipase. And this would possibly tie in with the slightly higher rates of lipolysis we we're seeing early on. So it may just be a, a normal physiological signaling, but there's a difference here. So that's, that's something. We looked at C-peptide and really no difference in insulin release. You'll notice this slight kick up here, and this is where we gave our subjects, we give our subjects a banana and a yogurt after the three hour blood sample, just to keep them happy. Because if you've been fasting overnight and you'd had a muffin and a milkshake, uh, come you know one o'clock having lost about half a pint of blood and uh, you're not feeling great, and we didn't want people to get into a prolonged fasting state. So we give them a bit of that, and so it does push up the insulin a little bit, but it doesn't affect, you know, they adapt to that quite quickly and see the curve is going down. Um, these are the insulin results, almost identical uh, to the C-peptide. And we looked at glucose. Um, what I want to point out here is, is amazing gender effects. And, uh, it may be that women are slightly smaller, but you know they really show very flat curves to the test. There's no difference between the treatments, and we noticed the same thing when we looked at the triglycerides. You give women 50 grams of fat, you give men 50 grams of fat. Women were you know eight, ten gram, kilograms lighter in weight. So, in terms of load, it's even more. And then if you take into account women are you know 25% fat. In lean body mass, it's even more, you know. So they are very sensitive to um, postprandial carbohydrate and, and glucose and seem to be really efficient at clearing. I mean, we think this is ovarian hormones because we've done similar studies in, in 
um, not with interest terrified fats, but in postmenopausal women with uh, higher layer fats and show that they show quite big increases in, in lipids. So, you know, women did secrete more insulin, lower postmenopausal glucose, lower triglycerides. So you need to take that into account when looking at these studies. Um, I've always wondered why women put on more fat than men eating the same diet and uh, and it you know it's a, an interesting conundrum isn't it men and women eat the same proportion of fat and calories and deposit in different places so implications long-term health risks I mean I don't think our data shows there's any evidence of increased remnants um, the decreased lipemia seems to be associated with a higher melting point and we get decreased fat seven activation that actually would be on the positive side but it's a surrogate risk marker um, and as far as interest verified C16 uh, fats they don't really differ at all on postprandial glucose homeostasis um, I know Casey has done some work on the C18 um, fats uh, we did look at it with interest verified shea uh, butter and found no effect on um, glucose or insulin homeostasis but I'd be a little bit cautious about our Shea study because it was a, a very high melting point fat it wasn't a typical uh, fat um, yeah the benefit as I see it interesterified from place trans I don't think we've identified any hazards with regard to postprandial lipemia I could turn it around and say there well maybe benefits but I I think there are phenomena that are different and I think that's the first point uh, the gaps I think we have is we we don't know much about shorter chain fatty acids c12 c14 interesterified um, I think there's need for a head-to-head -head comparison of realistic stearic acid rich interesterified fats with pyrimetic acid rich interesterified fat as would be used commercially that's the important thing not some hypothetical thing um, and I, I think we know very we know quite a lot about interesterified enzymic interesterified stearic palmitic acid rich fat but very little about stearic acid rich fat so that's a gap we had a whole novel food approval for palmitic acid rich fat which was really quite rigorous in in Europe um, the other issue is the elephant in the room which is obesity and overweight and you know where two-thirds of the population fall into that category you need to do studies on those sorts of people and it may well be that you you might get slightly different effects with remnants on overweight people which you don't see in healthy young subjects so that is a caveat and I I, I don't really I can't un explain the final bit I mean I think there is um, you know gut peptides seem to be altered and so we've shown with the palmitic acid rich one it changes secretion of a gut peptide and signaling there are a whole load of other gut peptides as well and um, it might might be important in terms of appetite regulation but we need to interpret what that actually means at the moment I can't show any effect on insulin release but maybe I was looking at people who got a normal insulin response we know that people who've got type 2 diabetes have impaired responses to incretins um, so there it may come might be mean a little bit more um, but I mean I think that that's a question one needs to, to look at okay so I'll leave it at there thanks